in this second portion of our series on God's purpose for the believer we remember that his purpose for each one is that he become conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus is the express image of God and God's purpose is that each one of his own might be made in his image. So God is carrying out his purpose amongst his own today. The purpose that he set forth in the first chapter of the word back in Genesis. Let us make man in our image. And even though the first Adam failed through the fall, God continued his purpose in the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we were born again, when we were born into the Lord Jesus, we were placed in the last Adam. And now our Christian growth consists of becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus, that he might more and more fully be our life in our everyday walk, that it might be less of self and more of Christ, that it might be as we grow, not I, but Christ, more and more fully. <clears throat> it's not a matter of an experience, a once-for-all thing at all. It is a matter of growth, uh, maturing, a development, a progression that we are less self-centered and more centered in the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and one thing that we should spend some time on in this second portion is the how of God's purpose, how he works his purpose in our lives. Most Christians are wondering about all this and how it comes about, how God does it. And there doesn't seem to be too much shared on this subject, too much available. The how of it all. And it's so important for us to know how God works because much of God's work is paradoxical. It's the opposite of what it might seem. Uh, the principle of uh, life coming out of death is a paradox. And God works along these lines in our development so often that the way up is down. And if we don't realize how he does things, we're going to get all twisted around and all frustrated because one of the ways he causes us to grow is to take us into death. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So if we don't know what he's doing, if we don't understand his ways, we'll, and when he takes us down, we'll think that uh, everything has gone wrong and we won't be able to cooperate, we won't be able to understand, we'll be actually fighting against God asking him to get us out of a situation that he has placed us in for a specific reason. Whereas when we come to know what he's doing, we can rest in his will and uh, rejoice in what he's doing and exercise faith and uh, there'll be a better testimony before others because of our attitude of, as God works. And if we turn to Romans 8, 28 and 29, we can see something here of the how of God's working in carrying out his purpose in the believer, of making the believer in, his, in God's image. Romans 8, 28 and 29. <clears throat> and it's very important to 
see here that these two verses go together. We most often quote Romans 8.28 or hear it quoted, but actually the verse alone, the 28th verse alone, does not really make sense. It needs the 29th verse to fill it out, as we shall see here. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If we stop there, the verse doesn't tell us what God's purpose is. So we have to go into verse 29 to see what the purpose is. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now we will read the two verses together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And as we have already seen, that is God's purpose, that the believer be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus is the express image of God. And that is what God is doing in the life of the believer today, although the believer may not realize it. But when he does come to realize it, there is a great difference in his attitude and in his understanding of God's ways and uh, the realization of what's happening to him. And we notice here in this 28th verse that all things work together for good to the Christian, to the one that loves God. And a Christian might have something happen to him that is quite difficult, quite hard. And he might say, well, how, how could this ever be for good in my life? And it may not seem to be at all good. But the Word says that all things work together. And this particular thing that may happen to one is geared. It may be geared with something that will happen 20 years from now or next month or next year that will that the and then the believer will understand how it's working together for good the thing is that all things are working together they're synchronized god has them worked out god is fitting them together and one incident may be years and years apart from another or another series of incidents, but all of them are working together for the one purpose, and that is to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we notice too here that all things are working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, and it's very comforting, very reassuring to realize that God has called each and every believer uh, to his purpose. It's the calling of each one of us. Many wonder what my calling is. What, what is God, uh, has God called me? Well, each believer, every believer, no matter who he is, has been called of God. And he's been called of God for this specific reason. That's his calling to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his basic calling. We notice in uh, Romans 1, 6, Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. And all of these things that are working together for good, they are being worked together by God. And then in Philippians 1, 6, Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ. God uh, finishes what he begins, and he's the one who performs it. For it is God which worketh in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. And of course, his good pleasure is that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. That is what God is, is uh, doing today <clears throat> in, the life, in, the, in the life of the hungry believer. 
And then in Hebrews 13:21, Now the God of peace make you mature in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. And God is working in the believer. And he's working that which it pleases him. And he's doing it through the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God does, everything that he has done, has been centered in the Lord Jesus, who is our life. And he's completed all the work in him. And we're complete in him. And now uh, the development and the progression and the process that the believer is experiencing is uh, simply God working his life that he has deposited, let's say, in the Lord Jesus. He's working that life out into the uh, the Christian's everyday experience. And he's doing it through the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and it's also uh, comforting to see that God is sovereign. And it's a sovereign God who is working all things together. He's in complete control. This is his universe, and he is uh, he has this universe uh, time to the billionth of a second. And there's nothing out of line. And all is under the control of God, and yet at the same time, it's under the Lord Jesus' control. We see in uh, Colossians 1, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The Lord Jesus is holding the universe together, he's holding everything together, and he's holding it under his control all geared and all aimed at God's purpose and all contributing everything is a contributing factor to that one aim of God one goal for his own uh, to be conformed to the image of his son that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell for in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in him. My, what we have in the Lord Jesus, and how important it is for us to see in the word what is ours in him, so that we can learn to really take our place as a branch in this true vine, and really allow his life to flow, and that he might be manifested in us, that he might be seen in us, that he might be in control by the Holy Spirit, that he might be our life not only positionally, but in our everyday walk, conditionally. And a further thought on the all things in First Thessalonians 5.18. The word here, Paul says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that tiny word, in. In everything give thanks. Well, if everything is working together for our good, then it is up to us to realize that and to rest in this fact. For instance, Often a Christian will be in a hard situation, difficult, and his first thought is to get out of it, that things might be uh, comfortable and uh, easy once more. So that often the Christian will pray to God to help him and to get him out of a certain situation. And he'll go to others and ask them to pray for him. And he'll do all that he can, struggle and uh, manipulate, maneuver, to get out of a situation. And then he, if he is able to get free, he'll give thanks to, to God for freeing him. Whereas the word says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that we are to uh, first make sure that God is getting his 
work done in us in the situation that he has placed us in or allowed us to get in. We may get into a situation through our own failure. God uses this to show us our weakness, to show us uh, something of self. And when he has the work done, he'll take us out of the situation. He'll get us out in his own way and in his own time. If we escape a situation that seems to be tight, uh, we, there will only be another one waiting for us down the road. God is going to get his work done. So that when we learn what he's doing, it, we're better able to rest in the circumstance and allow him to do his work uh, here and now, right now so that uh, there'll be more progress and then the next incident that he takes us in will be for the next bit of our development. So it's important to realize that uh, God's word says in everything give thanks for this is God's will for us. And it's a principle. This is a principle to realize that God is using all things for our good so that we can rest and uh, trust him in everything and uh, love him in all these situations and not feel that he's uh, punishing us or uh, being unfair to us or allowing something to happen that he's not noticing and that uh, something's out of his control and we we have to uh, struggle to uh, rectify and uh, rectify the situation so that uh, everything won't go wrong no no god is in control and when we see this we are better able to exercise faith and better able to uh, to be a, a better testimony before others in difficult times that we can rejoice in the Lord Jesus and be at peace while he carries out his work. So it's important to know God's how. How, how important it is, this knowledge, to know what's going on. <clears throat> For instance, uh, you might be home alone at night and there's a, a noise at the window. And instantly, if you don't know just what that is, there's an instant physical and mental uh, reaction. And fear uh, comes into the picture and you're alerted. Whereas if you knew that that noise at the window was simply a vine rustling as the wind blows, if you know what it is, there's an altogether different reaction. As a matter of fact, you like that sound. It's part of your home. It's very comforting. And you've heard it for years. <clears throat> and it gives you a, a sense of peace. And the whole difference here is between peace and fear is the knowledge of knowing what's going on. And it's the same way in God's dealings with us. When we realize what God is doing, when we realize that he's using all things and working them together for our development of conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can rest. We can be at peace. We can rejoice in Him and in His workings. So it's important for us to know the way God works in carrying out His purpose. And if we turn over to Galatians 4.19, there's an added thought here. <clears throat> concerning our being made more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here in Galatians 4.19 that this same purpose of God was Paul's basic heart burden. And it was his goal for not only his own life, but it was his goal for every one of his converts. Galatians 4.19 My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And this clearly reveals that 
So Paul didn't make the actual conversion in, in winning a, an individual to the Lord Jesus. He didn't make the actual conversion the goal, but it was a, actually a means to God's end. Important as birth is, it's still only birth. And the new birth is but a beginning. Whereas so much of our personal work today is all focused on the decision, the commitment, so-called. And so often this babe, if it is a true healthy birth, this babe is left on the doorway, so to speak, and the mother in Israel or the father uh, rushes off and uh, works for at another decision. Whereas Paul's real goal was that that new convert would be nurtured and developed and assisted and fed until it uh, saw God's goal for it so that it could uh, set out with its own heart burden that it might be as a Christian more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ and that was God, uh, Paul's burden for his converts my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you and it does it is a matter of travail in birth it is a matter of giving one's life so to speak that the converts might develop and grow and mature it's a uh, sharing There's a principle there that um, if there's going to be growth, there must be a real sharing of life. But what we have uh, done so often today and in past days is to make the atonement everything. But when that happens, even with the converts, they feel, well, now I'm born again, now I'm saved, and there's a tendency to settle down upon that fact, upon the birth. And we see that so often amongst uh, our converts today in our churches. While I'm in, I'm, I'm not going to hell, and I'm, I'm sure of heaven. Uh, I have uh, more or less arrived. Whereas if our goal is that of Paul's and that of the Lord Jesus for each convert, that there might, they might be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, they might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, might grow then the birth is but a start, a beginning. And we'll be very careful to see that that is a healthy birth because we know that if it is not healthy, the growth will be hindered. And our, our burden, our heart burden, should be for the growth and the development which will help us to make sure that the birth is a good, strong, healthy birth. And then to assist this convert how important that is in our service to assist each convert to get a good beginning and to see God's purpose for him or her. Well, now a further word in this matter of God's how in his uh, development of each of us. in that he uses everything. Because he does use everything and he uses uh, everyone, so to speak. In our family life, say we're the only believer in one's family, a wife with a husband unsaved, maybe the children unsaved, seeking to live and grow in the Lord Jesus in this type of circumstance. And uh, the unsaved do not understand. They're not sympathetic. And there's pressure. Well, God uses this for the Christian's development. And so many Christians feel, well, if I were in better circumstances, I would uh, grow more. No, not at all. 
God is sovereign. God is using all things that are in your life today. And it's time for the believer to settle down upon this fact and see him as God and acknowledge this and to rest in him and to allow him to carry out his purpose right where we are. And there may be a situation in a family where all, all are Christians, but that one is, uh, so to speak, hungrier than the others or a little more advanced. Then there is a similar situation where there's misunderstanding, pressures, same thing all over again. And often, too, uh, matter of fact, too often, the believer who is hungry, or if he's the only believer in the family, he has created much of the difficulty himself. He's probably rushed into the picture too definitely and too early and too much and uh, sought to force the rest of the family to be saved, apply pressure, and there's been a reaction. Well, God uses this too to show us how not to do things. And we learn, finally, it takes years, we finally learn how to allow him to work through us. And as we grow in the Lord Jesus, as our family and our neighbors and co-workers and fellow students have an opportunity to watch us grow, and they have an opportunity to see in our daily walk some of the reality of which we speak, then they're being conditioned. They have the need, if they're unsaved, they have the need if they're a Christian and not hungry and not ready to grow. They may hide that need, but it's there. There's no question about that. The need is there. And that need will be felt by them as they are conditioned by the Lord Jesus manifesting himself more and more fully in the individual believer where they begin to become hungry and they begin to see the contrast between their own lives and what they see of the Lord Jesus, what they're learning about Him. And then comes the conviction of sin. Then comes the conditioning where they're ready for the Christian's approach with the Word and with love and with understanding, with patience. So we see that the Christian must grow before he is able to, before he is in the condition where the Lord Jesus can work through him, as only he can work. And as the Christian realizes and sees that God is using all of these home situations and neighborhood situations and work situations and school situations, as he sees that God is using this to develop him, he his attitude becomes more and more, well, Lord, uh, thy will be done. I realize what you're doing, Lord, and I trust you, and I will rest in thee as thou dost carry this work out. And the attitude becomes, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And another reason for these difficulties that God allows in the life. Yes, that God creates in the life. Yes, and difficulties that God allows us to, in our failure to create in our own lives, our own errors, our own mistakes, our own sin. Most of the difficulties that we have, uh, even though God is engineering them, we create them. They're our fault. But God does it this way so that we'll come more fully to realize what self really is, what failures we really are in ourselves, so that we'll learn to abide in the Lord Jesus as branches. So one of the, another one of the main reasons for all of these failures in the Christian life and these difficulties, these impossible situations, are that we will learn not to 
look for peace and joy and rest in our circumstances. But God wants us to rejoice in Him and to rest in Him and be at peace with Him and in Him. But so often, if things are going very well and we feel that we're being used of God and everything is just fine, actually our hearts are resting and rejoicing in our circumstances, in the fact that we feel that God is blessing us and so forth. And there's a, there's a tremendous element of self here, self-satisfaction, although we may not realize it. And God is using the difficulties to tear all this away that all we have to rejoice in and to rest in is God, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He wants to be our all. So that He's not going to allow circumstances to be such that we'll rest in them and that we'll rejoice in them. And he doesn't do it vindictively. He, he knows what's best for us. He knows what's good for us. He knows that he's the only source of peace and joy and rest. The thing is that we do not know it until he teaches us through failure. And finally we come to the place in our growth where we learn to rest in him. Then God is able to use any type of circumstance, no matter how difficult it might be, to develop us further and we're still at peace our joy and our peace and our rest are in him regardless of what the circumstances might be whether they're good or bad so called our joy and our love and our peace are in him and there's a further reason for these difficulties as we think of 2 Corinthians 1, very important area here in these few verses in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. My, what a wonderful portion of God's Word here. <clears throat> what a wonderful principle. He's called here the Father of mercies. And it's important for us to to see God as our Father. One of the, I think one of the obvious signs of a Christian, a young Christian's growth, one of the first signs is that when he, in his praying, that he, at first, usually a Christian prays to God calls him God. And one of the first signs of real development is when he begins to pray to his father, begins to call God Father. And he is our father. And he's a father of mercy. And it's a good thing that he is because is it not true that we we require a great deal of mercy as Christians. Grace and mercy because of self, because of the way we are in ourselves and because of our all the aspects of self that are resonant within our hearts that have come from Adam that we have developed through the years. Sin. And God is able to be merciful to us because he is our Father and because we are in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're accepted in him. And so his mercy is available and it's free and there's no holding back with it. 
God can be merciful to us without stint because we're fully accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the God of all comfort. Well, often we seek comfort in many other realms. The end, uh, it takes a long time for God to bring us around to finding our comfort in Him. And He does this through failure. He does this through difficulties. He does this through trial. He does this through tribulation that He engineers and that He allows us to get ourselves into so that we have nobody to blame but ourselves. But in mainly in the instances where things happen to Christians, say there's a sorrow in the family, uh, things like that, that happen to Christians the same as they happen to everyone else. So many uh, believers feel that now that I'm a Christian, God's going to protect me and that nothing's gonna, nothing bad is going to happen to me. I'm not going to have any difficulties because all I have to do is pray to God and He'll... Uh, He'll get me out of these situations and keep me from any harm. And um, but this is this is wrong thinking. Uh, God uh, takes Christians often through harder things than He does those who are unsaved. But these are the all things that are working together for good to the believer, to the one who loves God, in His purpose of conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the thing is that he comforteth us in our tribulation. In all of our tribulation, he said. Not only so that we can rest in him and rejoice in him in the midst of these things, but also that we might learn about his comfort, <clears throat> experience it, and find out that God's comfort is sufficient. and that he can take us through anything and we can experience his comfort and we can rest in him and it is not only for our development for our rest while he works but it is also that we might understand what others are going through. Not only others unsaved about us, other Christians. For instance, we all have neighbors, and most usually they're unsaved folk majority of them and it's interesting to realize how these people know so much about a Christian and they're watching this Christian these Christians daily they may not uh, allow you to realize that but they are and it's interesting to realize how much they know about Christians and what a Christian ought to be And they're watching the Christian when he gets into a hard situation. They're watching his reaction. They're watching what he thinks of God now. They're watching to see how God is going to help him now. And there's where the testimony comes when things are difficult in the Christian home, Christian life. Our reaction to God. And when a Christian is resting in God and a Christian can rejoice and be at peace in God when things are difficult, uh, there is the powerful testimony to the lost and then when the neighbor is in trouble he knows where to turn because he certainly doesn't have the comfort being unsaved but he knows who has God's comfort 
And then when uh, then when the Christian approaches the one in sorrow, for instance, the neighbor, the neighbor is going to be amenable to his approach if his approach is in love and it's in understanding because the Christian realizes what this person is going through. He's been through similar things. And the Christian knows through experience and through the word God's faithfulness and God's comfort in all of his tribulation. And he's able to share this with the needy heart, the needy neighbor, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God, God's very comfort that we're able to share. And these are stepping stones. These are uh, things that prepare the unsaved to bring them to the place where they uh, know enough about God and the Lord Jesus, having seen his work in the believer, having seen something of him in the believer's life, that they have come to the place where they know enough about God that they're able to trust him, enough to come to him and take him as their Savior that they don't do it blindly, that they don't do it because the Christian has argued them into something and used certain verses to bring them to a decision. No, they have had time to make up their own minds. Then we're going to have a healthy birth. Then we're going to have a new believer who has made up his own mind and he has taken the Lord Jesus Christ because he's realized that he's needed him. This makes for a healthy birth. And further, the Christian who has taken time and watched this individual be prepared is going to be in the position to help him grow more definitely because so much of the work was done even before the person was saved. And there's a oneness there, there's a fellowship there, there's an understanding there, there's a love there between the two, which makes it just natural to go on and grow together. The groundwork is there. How important this is, not only to be saved, born again, but to grow. So here is what is necessary for the believer to see. The fact that the Lord Jesus never promised to leave us without trial and conflict, but he did promise never to leave us comfortless. The Christian is not exempt from trial and tribulation. Those are the very things he needs for his development. But the thing is that in these things and while he is being taken through them he has the comfort and the fellowship and the peace and the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ God doesn't put us through things the Lord Jesus takes us through things and he's been there before dear friend he has been all the way to the cross and he wants to train us so we will have strong, brave spirits that will not shrink when he wants to prove he can give us victory in the midst of trial by giving us grace to live above it. Well, when we realize that we're branches in the vine and we learn to abide in him, then when we're in a situation of tribulation and trial and pressure, We're able to rest and hide in him, to abide in him, and to draw from him, and to agree with what he's doing, and to exercise faith in him, and not to be all frustrated and upset and struggling to get free. And as we hold still and rest in the tribulation, he can get his work done all the quicker and relieve us of the pressure all the sooner. But if we struggle and kick and cry and smash our testimony, he's only going to have to wait and do it again later. 
because he has a purpose, an eternal purpose. And he's placed us in his son in order to carry that purpose out. And he wants us to see that and rejoice in it and understand it and agree with him and thank him giving thanks in all things this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus so we have this wonderful truth that God is sovereign God is God and that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to God's purpose for whom God did foreknow God also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son for it is God which worketh in us both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So we can praise the Lord for our everyday circumstances, whether they be in the home, at work, wherever it is, in the ministry, on the field, no matter what, that God is God, God is sovereign, God is working everything together to carry out his wonderful purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we rest in Thee. We rest in Thy will. We thank Thee for revealing Thy will to us, Thy basic will for our lives, that it might be for us more and more fully, not I, but Christ, but the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we thank Thee for this, Father, in His precious name. Amen. <laughs>